So everyone, thank you for joining today, whether you're on Zoom or you're on one of our live streams. Uh, we really, really appreciate you all showing up and um, on Zoom, it looks like we have people from Chicago, ne Netherlands, New Mexico, Pakistan, Michigan, um, Philippines. Um, love seeing where everybody's coming from. Um, my name's Nathan. If you've seen one of our webinars, you probably already know me. But, uh, my name's Nathan. Uh, I'm a marketing manager here at Data Science Dojo. And today uh, we have Arham Noman. He's a, one of our data scientists, and he's also an instructor for our paid programs. Um, and our home is going to be presenting web scraping with Python and Beautiful Soup, which if you've been on our YouTube channel, we do have a uh, tutorial on this already, but it's a little outdated. So this is an updated version. So our home, why don't you go ahead and take it away? All right. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Nathan. Uh, hi, everyone. It's, uh, I'm Arham Noman. Uh, I've been, I am a data scientist at Data Science Dojo, uh, and I've been involved in all sorts of interesting work uh, during my time here. Um, everything from designing course content to uh, developing and deploying uh, data science solutions for corporate customers. So it's been an interesting time here, And uh, but enough about me. Uh, so let's actually get to the reason why everyone's here. Um, before we get started with the content, uh, here is what the agenda for today looks like. Um, I have this short slide deck. We will be talking about some things that are nice to have before you come into this webinar and uh, what the goals are for today so that, you know, just to set the expectations. Um, I'll also talk about a little bit about what web scraping is, why do we actually use it, and uh, uh, some things that you should be careful of before you start web scraping. Uh, and I'll keep bringing that point up a lot to, during the webinar. Uh, and then finally, we'll move on to a live uh, coding exercise where I will go to a website and I'll show you the process um, through which you actually, um, you know, uh, figure out how you're going to extract data from a website. Uh, and then the final thing, which um, I couldn't find at least when I was looking for web scraping tutorials is, uh, I'm gonna show you how you can automate the web scraping script using, um, a cloud platform. So in this case, because I'm comfortable with Azure, I'm going to be using Azure functions, but the idea should be pretty similar across um, other cloud platforms, right? Um, so that's what uh, our agenda for today looks like. Uh, a few things that are nice to have before you come into the webinar. Uh, these will make your experience a lot better. Um, the first thing that I would uh, uh, expect people to know a little about a little bit about is basic Python. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Python syntax. I'm not going to you know um, explain what a for loop is, explain uh, how types work in Python, for example. Uh, I would expect people to have some knowledge of that already. Uh, so uh, I will try to explain as much as I can, uh, but I don't. I want to actually spend more time on the inter interesting stuff, right? Um, then I would expect you to have a little bit of knowledge about HTML, uh, you know, things like what an HTML tag is, uh, what are class names, um, how is an HTML file structured. Uh, this will help you uh, follow along when we are actually uh, looking at the HTML pages that we are going to scrape. Okay. Uh, if you want to follow along, there are a couple of things that uh, you should have uh, set up on your machine uh, when you're following along. So. The first thing, most obvious thing perhaps is a code editor. Uh, so that can be VS code, that can be sublime text. If you're a little bit old school, you might prefer Vim. Um, I would recommend VS code. And the only reason I recommend VS code is because we are going to be working with Azure functions and um, Azure functions integrates. In fact, the entire Azure pl platform integrates really well with VS code. Uh, it makes a lot of things easier you can do it without VS Code, but it will just be a bit more work and a few more steps. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about the steps because I'm going to be using VS Code uh, in this webinar. So if you want to follow along for that part, you should uh, actually have VS Code with the Azure Functions plugin installed. Okay. And then finally, there are two Python packages that we are going to need. Uh, we're going to need Beautiful Soup 4. It's called, if you're installing it through PIP or Conda, it's going to be BAS4. And then there's Pandas uh, to actually, uh, you know, hold the data that we extract. Um, one more thing uh, that I forgot to add here because 
I had a interesting debugging session today uh, for this webinar. Um, if you are using the Azure Functions ext uh, extension for VS Code, uh, you sh the latest version of Python that is supported is Python 3.9. Um, I had Python 3.10 and uh, I tried running it today. It didn't work and it took me a while to figure out that that was the issue that it expects. It doesn't support 3.10 yet, okay? So if you're going to be working with the Azure Functions uh, extension, uh, the latest version of Python that you can have is Python 3.9. If you don't, it's going to complain that you don't have a valid version of Python. And uh, yeah, then you'll have to uh, you know figure that out. So just a word of warning before um, you go ahead and set up your environment. Um, as for the expectations for today, um, here are some of the things that you can expect to learn today. So you, we will be navigating an HTML page. We'll be figuring out how you can find the relevant data that you want to extract on an, on an HTML page. Uh, we'll be using the beautiful soup package to parse that HTML page and then extract um, data iteratively from that page. And we will also be uh, automating the, uh, our web scripting script and deploying that, showing you how you can deploy it to an Azure function. Um, in terms of who I think would benefit the most uh, from today, uh, I would say people who have little to no exposure to web scraping uh, would probably find this the most useful. But uh, you know, if you have experience with web scraping, uh, you might, I, I still haven't seen uh, much on how to automate your web scraping scripts using Azure Functions. So that might still be something that is useful and interesting to you. So you might want to stick around for that. Um, but yeah, uh, just to you know, set the expectations for today, here is what we are going to be covering, okay? Um, with that said, let's actually jump into the content. So uh, first of all, what is web scraping? Um, very simply, web scraping is the idea that you go to a web page and you extract relevant data from that web page. Um, that can be for any reason, you might be looking at jobs on uh, LinkedIn and you might want to uh, you know, be able to extract a large number of jobs and see if uh, maybe you want to run some um, machine learning algorithm on them to figure out if you are a good fit uh, for a, a posted job, or it can be any reason really. Uh, but the idea is that you want to extract data from a web page, and uh, um, you and there uh, and uh, essentially there is no. Um, nice way to do it let me put it like that uh web scripting is kind of a workaround to that right and that brings us to the next point why do we actually need web scripting well uh in the absence of apis in the absence of nice csv or pdf or excel files uh being made available from a website owner you might not be left with any other option right so if you want data, it's not been exposed in a nice way, then you might have no other option than to use web scraping to get the data that you want, okay? Um, with that said, uh, web scraping is one of those things that is very powerful and very easy to misuse, right? Uh, even if you're running it on your own machine, it is very easy to misuse, uh, but uh, the second, especially the second part of today, where I will be showing you how you could deploy it to Azure, that is uh, perhaps the most dangerous thing of all, because if you set that up incorrectly, uh, it will likely result in um, Azure will not be happy, let me put it like that, right? So uh, before you uh, start with web scripting, um, there's two things that you need to be careful of. First of all, make sure that the website owner is okay with it. Um, not everyone wants bots on their website uh, scraping data um, because there is a server cost to it, there is a performance cost to it, and uh, maybe they just don't want you to be able to you know, extract data. They want you to visit, actually visit the page if you want to get that data, right? So the way that you find out if, uh, if the website owner is okay with that is typically you can read the terms of service. Um, they will usually have that explicitly mentioned or alternatively you can try a simple web scraping script if a simple web scraping script does not work uh, you know if it's blocked uh, by the owner then that is um, 
an indication that they are probably not okay with it, right? The harder it is to scrape their website, the less likely they are it is that they're okay with it, okay? And then the next thing you need to be careful of is uh, if someone is nice enough to actually allow you to scrape their website, uh, don't send out a large number of requests, right? So like I said, there is a performance cost, there is a actual uh, dollar amount associated with each uh, request. So if someone has, uh, has been nice enough to allow you to do that, please don't actually send you know, millions of requests and overwhelm their server. This will most likely, the best thing that can happen is you will get your IP address banned. And um, the worst thing that can happen is you might receive a letter from your ISP, right? Uh, so just be careful about that. Uh, this is typically dangerous enough on a local machine, but once we deploy it to the cloud, this becomes, uh, uh, very scalable and very, very dangerous, right? So please be careful about these two things uh, before you attempt to um, web scrape uh, on your own, right? Uh, okay, that's pretty much it for uh, the slide deck. Yeah, I think I will move on uh, to the, yeah. So with that said, I'm gonna move on to the actual practical exercise, okay? So, I am going to go to eBay. And in fact, I should probably open this up in incognito window because it might have something saved from my search history. Okay. So I'm going to go to eBay.com. And uh, so the example that I'm showing today is going to be something that's relevant to me, something that's uh, of my interest. But um, the idea that I'm going to show is going to be, you know, pretty much applicable across um, across other websites that you would want to scrape, right? I don't want to. So the idea is not that, hey, this is how you scrape eBay. Uh, this is how you scrape for a search term on eBay. Uh, the idea is that here's how you scrape in general. Uh, here's how you find patterns in general. And uh, um, yeah, so I would like you to be able to, you know, go to any website of your choice and, you know, just find those patterns in the HTML file and figure out, you know, how are you going to script this file, uh, this website, right? Okay, so uh, let's say you go on eBay and uh, I might need to make the page bigger because, yeah, okay. So let's type in a search term. Um, like I said, this is going to be based on my interest. So, you know, let's say PlayStation 5, right? something interesting for me. And if I type in PlayStation 5, you'll see that it brings up these couple of results. Yeah, well, not couple of results, there's a lot of results, but it brings up this structured sort of format of results, right? So you can see each um, result that you get, it has a structure, right? So it has this image, it has a title, it has um, this thing that uh, says something like, you know, authorized dealer, same day shipping, et cetera. It has a rating, it has a price associated with it and so on, right? Uh, there are slight variations uh, in each um, listing. So for example, this one doesn't have a rating. Um, some of these have this, this sponsored uh, text written on them, but in general, the structure is pretty similar, right? And if I wanted to um, extract data from it, then I, all I need to do is figure out how do I uh, navigate this structure, right? So that's the idea of web scraping, right? Uh, you need to figure out the patterns that exist. You need to figure out how do I uh, sort of exploit those patterns to get the data that I want, okay? So let me show you how you find those patterns. So if I press the F12 key, um, so I'm on edge, but this should be pretty similar for other browsers as well. Typically F12 opens up developer tools and let me just make this a little bigger. So if I press the F12 key, then it opens up this HTML file uh, for the page, right? And an HTML file, for those of you who don't know, an HTML file is basically, um, you can think of it as code that renders the everything that you see on your browser, right? So if I hover over something, you'll see if I hover over this, um, so this thing before, this thing is called a tag. So right after this, uh, I don't know what you call this sign, uh, but this thing is called, uh, so this div right here, it's called a tag, right? 
And uh, the way that an HTML file is structured, it's essentially just a hierarchical structure with these tags and a, uh, you know, a tag can have multiple tags as children inside of it, right? And that is how pages are rendered, okay? So if I hover over this div tag with this um, class name, um, whatever this is, right? You'll see that it's highlighting uh, the page uh, so it's high, that blue highlight on top of the page, right? So uh, this is built into modern browsers. If you hover over uh, an HTML element, it'll um, it'll highlight uh, what part of the page it corresponds to, right? And if I keep going down, you'll see, so this corresponds to that part and so on, right? And uh, yeah, this is pretty much how pages are, uh, uh, pages are rendered uh, using an HTML5. And uh, the thing about HTML page, uh, pages is that these, um, so there are some standard names uh, that are used as best practices, but in general, uh, these things called class names. So you see this class equals whatever this is, right? Uh, some, most of the times it's in control of the web developer, they can actually name it pretty much anything that they want to. And that's where the differences come in multiple pages, right? So um, what makes Amazon different from eBay is well, most likely if you go to Amazon, the class names for a div tag might be different. Um, there will be other differences, of course, but uh, that is where the difference comes when you're trying to scrape them, right? You just need to figure out where your data that you want resides in this HTML file, right? Now, if the page was small enough, you could, you know, just keep hovering until you find um, the part that highlights what you're interested in, uh, but there's an easier way. And because this is a really complicated HTML file, um, I will just use that easier way, right? So I am interested, for example, in the price. So I can just highlight the price. And if I right click, there is this option that says inspect. And if I click on it, it will take me right to that element, right? So yeah, it brought me right to where this thing is being rendered, okay? So this span tag with the class name s hyphen item underscore price, um, that has the price stored for uh, this first uh, result, okay? If I go to the next one, uh, just to verify, you know, yeah, it has the same span tag with the same class name. And, you know, just to be sure, one more, I can check. And there you go, same span tag, same uh, class name, right? So I found a pattern, right? I found that if I want to find the price, all I need to find is a span tag with this class name and I will be able to um, find the price for a given search result, okay? So now that we know that, let's actually start, um, let's actually start coding and figure out how do we, uh, Get that into beautiful soup. Okay, so I'm going to open up VS Code. In fact, I should open this up. Yeah. Okay, so I'm inside VS Code. I'm going to start a new notebook. Uh, we go a new Jupyter notebook, and I'm using a Jupyter notebook because it's easier to you know print the output and show you um, show you how it looks while I work along with it. Right. You can use a Python, um, Python notebook as well. Okay. Uh, I hope this is, yeah, this might be this one. Okay. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to import. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the beautiful soup uh, package. It's called BS4 and I'm going to import beautiful soup. Right. And I'm going to name it, let's call it soup, right? It's not soup strainer, let's call it soup. Yeah, this one's going to be a pain sometimes, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, the next thing, so beautiful soup, what it does is it allows you to um, interact with HTML pages in a really nice way, right? Um, you can navigate across tags in a really nice way. You can find specific tags. You can even uh, make changes in the HTML file uh, really easily if you want to. Uh, 
But the thing is, we need a way to get that HTML file into Python first, right? And for that, we have something called URL lib. So URL lib dot request import. And then let's call that. Yeah. So I've imported this thing called URL open. Uh, I have imported this thing called URL open uh, as urec into my code. And then the final thing that I will need is pandas. And I'm going to call that pd, and that's pretty much standard uh, naming convention, right? I can run this. This should work fine. OK. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to eBay. Where is eBay? Yeah, there it is. So I'm going to copy this URL that I have. Right? And I am going to save that as a variable. Let's call that my URL. OK. So I have, let's run that. Now we have that saved into a variable. Uh, now what we need to do is we need to go to this page and we need to load the HTML file into memory, right? And for that, we are going to use um, urec. So I can say client equals requests and we give it the name of the website, right? And if I print this out, uh, yeah, so it gave me an HTTP client object, right? Okay. So I see there are a couple of questions. Uh, so Steve is asking, will you talk about scraping pages that look JavaScript or single page apps? Sometimes when using Selenium. Yeah, Steve, I won't be going uh, that far uh, today. So this is just basic. Uh, web scraping i'm not going to be talking about using uh selenium uh, and then sandra asks how did you start the jupyter notebook in vs code yeah so sandra there is a if you go to the extensions marketplace there is a jupyter notebook extension uh if you have ipy kernel installed you can just start it from within so the way that i do it is uh, I, because i have the extension installed i press f1 oh, sorry if i press f1 and either jupyter and because I have the Jupyter extension, it gives me an option to create a new Jupyter notebook, right? So that's how I do it within VS Code. Okay. And then Arham, uh, there was a question about a URL. I think it was the um, the uh, eBay URL. Can you post that in the chat, or or send it to me, and I can post it in the chat. So that is pretty much, you can just go to even search for PlayStation 5 and just copy that URL or anything rather. This will work for any search term. Uh, so if you want the URL, just go to, uh, um, just go to a, uh, just go to eBay and search for whatever you're interested in, right? Okay. So I will move on. Okay. So now that we have this HTTP client, uh, we need to tell it that, hey, you need to actually go give me the HTML file. So how do I do that? Uh, I'm gonna call this page HTML, this is a variable, and I'm gonna say that, hey, take this HTTP client and read the data from there, right? Um, I can also print this out, but uh, this is going to, this will look really bad on uh, VS Code. I can show you how it looks like. Uh, and this might take a while to run as well. Yeah, so it's just this, um, it's the entire HTTP, uh, sorry, the entire HTML page, and uh, it's not really nice to look at, right? And this is where beautiful soup will come in. It's going to help make this a lot easier for us to navigate, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and clear that output. Okay. Um, it's nice to you know close your clients after you're done with them. Um, it's just best practice. You don't have to, but uh, you know, just keep your. I'm trying to keep the code as clean as possible. So I'm going to try and stick to best practices. So there we go. Now we have the HTML um, read into memory, right? So once we have HTML read into memory, now we need to parse it with beautiful soup. Okay, so I am going to create a, uh, let's say another variable, let's call it page soup. And I'm going to, because we call it soup, uh, we called it soup, right? 
So I'm going to give it this page HTML variable that we created. Right. And if I print this out, this should print a little bit nicer, but it's still going to be the entire. Oh, wait, I think I need to rerun this. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's still pretty messy, but let me show you what the difference is with this soup object compared to the HTTP, uh, the raw HTTP page, right? Okay, is this not wrong? Okay, so if I go back to the eBay website, um, what's the first div tag that we have? Yeah, I think it's this one, yeah. So let's say that I was interested in um, accessing, um, let's say this div tag, right? Or any div tag in general, right? Um, one thing that you can do in Beautiful Soup is that if you have a soup object, you can do page soup dot div. And if I run this, it's going to give me the first div tag that it comes across, right? So you can see here, it has the class name X header. Uh, that is the same as this one, right? There's another div tag right underneath this, but uh, it didn't fetch that because uh, it all, when you do, uh, when you access uh, HTML tags using the dot uh, method, it gives you the first result, right? Um, and then let's say that in this div tag, if I wanted to access, um, I don't know, let's say, yeah, let's say this other div tag, right? So I can chain uh, those uh, commands. I can do a div dot div. It will give me the first div inside of that first div, right? So it has this class name. And if we go back to the eBay page, um, the first div has this same class name in this first div, right? And then I can chain this as long as I want, right? I can, there's an A tag as well. And if I wanted to do the A tag, I can do that. And there's no further tag, otherwise I could chain this as long as I wanted to, right? So this is one way we could get our data. We could go back to this page. We could figure out, hey, this thing that I want, um, where is it in this entire HTML file? And then I could keep doing dot div, dot div, dot div, and dot div until I get to that tag, right? Um, that's not a very efficient way of doing it, things, right? So let's take a look at some a nicer way of doing it. So beautiful soup has this th command uh, built in called find. So if I do a dot find and I tell it, hey, I want to find a div tag, right? It's going to do the exact same thing as that dot uh, div that we did. It's going to find the first div tag, right? But what if I don't want the first div tag? What if I want a specific div tag, right? So let's say I want I want this div tag, right? So what I can do is I can copy this class name. And now, while it is running the find command, I can specify that, hey, I'm not interested in the first div tag. I want a div tag that has this specific class name, right? I want the first div tag that has this specific class name. And if I run this, it's only going to give me the first div tag that had this class name, right? So this is a lot more useful. I can find a specific price if I wanted to, right? So if I go back here, uh, Inspect. So if I want to find this tag, this is a span tag and it has this class name, right? So if I copy this and go back to my script, so the class name should be this and the tag should be a span tag. And if I run this, there you go. You got the price. I don't know who's selling a PS5 for $20. This might be some accessory or something that's showing up. Uh, or it might be yeah, it might be an auction or something. I'm not sure uh, why $20 is showing up. I would be skeptical of that. Uh, but yeah, that's how you find a specific tag uh, using B Beautiful Soup, right? So you can navigate that HTML uh, page a lot easier. I'm going to take a uh, minute to look at questions. Okay. So 
Asim is asking, can website block web scraping? Yes, Asim, definitely web websites can do that. Um, and in fact, most websites do do that because they're not interested in, uh, you know, they're not inter interested in having that extra traffic come in. And uh, it, there's, like I said, there is a performance cost and there is a, um, there is a actual dollar cost to allowing you to uh, scrape someone, uh, allowing you to someone to scrape your website, right? Uh, can you comment on using the versatility of Python Pitable Soup versus the command line? Uh, so by command line, if you're talking about just running this Python script in the command line, you know, just typing it out in the command line, I mean, um, so in terms of versatility, the nice thing about writing your script using Beautiful Soup is that you can, um, so like I will show you at the end of the day, you can um, deploy it to Azure Functions, you can uh, integrate it with other things because Python is really, uh, Python is really cool. It has a lot of cool libraries. If you want to learn machine learning on this, if you want to run, um, if you want to run text analytics, you can do things like that. So yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, okay, some people are complaining that they're not able to install beautiful soup. So it should be just BS4, uh, pip install BS4. If you're running into issues, I, yeah, I don't think I can comment on the specific issues that you're running into. Um, you can maybe, you know, just follow, just look at the webinar for now. And uh, yeah, maybe follow along later when you figure that out. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna move on. Uh, okay, yeah. So now we figured out how we can find the price of the first result, right? And uh, this is useful, but I'm not interested in only one result. Right. I want all the prices. So how do I do that? Well, it's a small change. Uh, so we were using find. There is another method called find all. And you can guess what will happen if I run this. Okay, so this symbol indicates that this is a list in Python. And in fact, I can, yeah, I'll show you that later. But essentially every item of this list is that span tag and it has the price, right? So we have all of the prices in this nice list, thanks to Beautiful Soup. Okay, and if I want to index this like a list, I can do that. So, so the first element I can, I don't know if this will work, I've never tried it. Okay, it does work, yeah. So I can even do colon indexing if I want to, right? And this is really, yeah, this is really convenient now, right? There's only one thing missing now. Um, I don't want this span, this entire thing, right? I'm only interested in this part. And so uh, in this case, because, uh, so when you want to access something that's in between um, the opening of a tag and the closing of a tag, the way that you do that is you take that object and you just type dot text. And that gives you whatever is in between uh, the tag, right? Okay. So now we know, um, now we have some idea of how we can extract it. So let's just write the code for that, right? So I am going to save this. Let's call this tags. I'm going to save this as a variable. I'm going to make an empty list and then I'm going to iterate over for stripe for example and let's call it an item tags I can iterate over this because this is a list I can iterate over it and then all I have to do is prices dot append and I can append um item dot text I print out the price list. There we go. Now we have a nice clean list of all the prices. Okay. So there's still a few problems with this. Uh, and I'll get to those problems as those come up, uh, as those start coming up. But 
we have for the most part we have a pretty nice list of prices right and we can use this uh for things that we want to do um the one of the issues right now is that uh if i were to look at any one element of this price list and i were to use type and in fact i should do this in the next cell so that it doesn't take time uh if i were to do this it's saying that it's a string right um i don't want my prices to be in a string i would prefer them to be in uh an integer or a float format because then it makes it easier for me to do further things like if i want to run if i want to make a histogram for example using zebra right uh, having those prices as an integer or a float would make my life a lot easier right so what can i do for that um this is where pandas comes in right we've gotten all of our data we've extracted it now we just need to store it in a nice way where we can use it for other things right so um i'm going to make a new variable let's call it numeric array and i'm going to use the two numeric function from pandas and what this does is uh, pretty self explanatory it converts an array that you give it into it will try to convert it to a numeric value so a numeric value can be a int a numeric value can be a float um and it will try to convert it right so i will say take this prices array and try to convert it to numbers if i run this okay it's complaining and if i scroll down it will tell you that i'm not able to parse this thing and it's saying that at position 0 is where i'm struggling okay Position zero means the first element of the string, and if you look at the first element of the string, it's this dollar sign, right? So, pandas is not able to, you know, figure out. We know that this is a currency, but pandas is not able to figure out that this is a currency and this is a dollar sign, and you know, it, I should be able to parse this, right? So, we need to fix that, right? Um, there's a lot of nice ways to fix this. I'm going to use a really quick and dirty way to fix it. Um, so what i'm going to do is because this is a string i can index it right like a list so i can just do this and if i print out the price of list here dollar sign is gone okay so i would recommend this uh, so the nice way to do it would be to use um something like dot strip and remove the dollar sign uh that way but because um i'm fairly confident that the dollar sign will always come at the beginning we can just use that right and if i run this now it's still complaining and this time it's complaining about this particular value it's saying that i can't parse this to a numeric value and you can imagine why right so this two uh some some listings don't have um one price they have a price range right so it's not able to parse this english language into um into a uh, a number right and it's also probably complaining about the dollar sign again and like i said the nice way to do it would be to use dot strip so that it removes every instance of it but we just used a really quick and dirty way of doing it right so uh there are ways to fix it uh you could take the lowest value you could take the highest value you could take the average value um i'm not going to do that i am just going to say that if you find something like this uh i am using something called uh so there's this uh argument you can pass to the two numeric function that says coerce the errors and what that means is if you find something that you're not able to convert to a number then just you know put a missing value there and if i run this we have an array and you'll notice these nans in between that is a missing value in python and uh, those are the the listings that had that uh, you know x to y um price range right so yeah those are bit, so now we have this um nice list of all the prices the only issue is that we have these missing values let's actually fix that so i'm going to make a data frame uh 
td dot data frame. So I'm going to convert this list into a data frame. What did I call it? Okay. Yep. I'm going to convert it to a data frame. And then I am going to do df is equal to And if I look at the data frame after this, there should be no missing values, but I can confirm. I can use df.hma. Was it this one? So our data frame is now cleaned, right? And uh, that's pretty much. Now we have this nice clean data frame uh, with all the values that we want. So we're, we can save this to a CSV file. We can use dot CSV, and um, let's call it I don't know CS five underscore prices dot CSV. We can run this and it should create this CSV file where we can use this data for projects that we have in mind later down the road, right? So this was something that was interesting to me, but let's say you're not interested, interested in PlayStation 5, right? You have some other thing that you're interested in. Okay, so if I go back to eBay, let's say I open up another window and Let's say you're interested in data science books, for example. Right. So how would you script? How would you modify this script to um, script pretty much anything that you want? Right. Uh, if you go back to the URL, you'll notice that there is this NKW, which most probably stands for new keeper or something like that. I don't know what the developer was thinking when they um coded that so i can't uh comment on that but you can see that this search term is here in the url itself right and so what if i wanted to make this a general script right so all i would have to do is remove this replace it with these two brackets right and for those of you who have done string manipulation in python you will know where i'm going with this so i can say a search term variable let's say data science and uh, so when you're typing a url there are no spaces so instead of spaces they typically use these plus signs so uh, you will have to follow that uh, convention when you're creating um, your new search term right so data science books and i can use a dot format and say that use this search term right and if i print this out it should be the new url okay yeah so data science books. And in fact, if I go to this URL, it should show me the same page. If I go to this URL, it should load the page. Yeah, see, data science books. Okay. So this is how you can make this, um, this script into a general script, right? If I run this again, if I run each cell again, it's uh, complaining about something. Okay, that was strange. Uh, okay, so I can run this, run it again. So this time we have a different array. You can see the prices are drastically different than before. I can run this and I can even make this uh, part uh, nice for uh, future, you know, using it in the future. I can format this by the search term. Right. If I run this, it will save another CSV file with the name of my search term and just this underscore prices. Right. So you can use this script to um, create a general uh, eBay web scripter right, for any search term that you might have. Uh, 
some websites show HTML result that is not the same as the inspected HTML source. So uh, the reason for that might be, you know, uh, if you're opening it from your regular browser, you might have some search history that would be influencing uh, the results that you see uh, on eBay or any other platform. So that might be the reason you might be getting different results if you um, access it using code, right? Uh, someone Ariva asks, how do I access the price without tags? So I think we talked about this Ariva. Uh, you just use dot text and then you have to clean it up a little bit um, using uh, to remove that dollar sign, right? Uh, Fizra asks, how do we know if website allow web scraping or not? So typically um, the correct way to do it is to read the terms of service if you don't have time or you know you're feeling a little lazy and not want to read the terms of service um just you know do a quick google search see if someone has scraped that website before and if they got into trouble for it and that should be an answer um if no one has scraped that website before just try one request um you know so don't send multiple requests just send one request with the client the using uh, the script that we have uh, make a client send a request and see if you get a response or not, right? Uh, typically, if they don't want you scraping their website, they will make it hard for you to scrape their website, right? So the harder it is to scrape their website, there are workarounds, of course, you can make it seem like you are a legitimate um, client, but typically the harder it is to scrape someone's website, the less likely it is that they are okay with you scraping their website, okay? So Tatiana asks how to integrate the data set with other attributes besides the price, such as rate description, so on. So Tatiana, to answer that question, if you go back to this, um, yeah. So let's say you want to extract, um, I don't know, uh, let's say you want to extract credit chips from, right? I go to inspect. So I need to extract a span tag with this class name, right? And I'm pretty sure if I go to, oh, okay. Okay, so you, this is where, oh no, it's right here, right? I thought this didn't have a shipping uh, information. So if I go to expect here, it's the same span tag with the same class name, right? And you can do this check for three or four more and you know, just to confirm that they all have the same span tag with the same class name. And then all you would have to do is go back to your script. Um, so, you right here, you're extracting um, this span type with this name, you would have to add another. So uh, let's say, in fact, let's try and do it. Uh, if I copy this, I don't know if this would work. And you can do a span tag and what was the name? Okay, so this class name, you can copy it. And you can go back here. In, and this should give you what you're looking for. Yep, there you go. So from Australia, from the United States, from the United Kingdom, and so on. And then whatever else you are interested in, uh, you just follow the same process that we have been following, right? Um, go to that item that you're interested in, click on inspect, see where that information is hidden and figure out the pattern that you need, um, that you need to find, right? So the process is pretty much the same, right? Um, but yeah, that is basic, uh, how you do basic web scraping. There are more advanced uh, concepts that are, I've, I don't think we have the time to cover. Um, there is one more thing I would like to cover, and that is how uh, you would automate this using Azure Functions, right? Thank you, Nathan. Um, okay, I won't take long because I'm not going to be doing this next part from scratch. Uh, doing it from scratch is kind of painful, uh, and we don't have a lot of time, right? Uh, okay, so now that you have this script and you want to automate it, right? Um, 
Okay, uh, one more thing. Nathan, uh, at this point, I think you should post the link to the Git repository uh, on our platform. Uh, so everyone who's attending, there is a repository that is going to have all of the code that I write today, including the function that I write. Uh, I won't be writing it from scratch, but I will make it available on that Git repository. So you can, it's freely available. You can go ahead to our platform, our code.datascienceroger.com, and you can clone that repository and, you know, uh, play around with the code if you want to, right? So uh, Nathan is going to post the link in chat. And I think, uh, yeah, it's going to be posted across all of our socials. Our team members should uh, be posting that. So uh, don't worry about the code. Uh, it will be available to everyone and you can go ahead and play, play around with the code, right? Um, okay, so real quick, let's talk about Azure Functions and how you can automate this and make this really interesting and really dangerous, right? So if you're in VS Code, um, there's this extensions tab, right? If you go to the extension marketplace and you search for Azure Functions, it should be the first result and Microsoft should be the one who created it. Um, don't, don't install a, uh, an extension that is created by someone else. Um, I already have this installed, but if you don't, um, it will give you a blue button just like this to install Azure Functions, right? So you can go ahead and do that. And what that will uh, enable for you is just like how I was able to create a Jupyter Notebook through uh, VS Code. If I press F1 and if I type functions, you'll see that Azure Functions also has this really nice integration where you can create a function in VS Code, right? So I can click on that. It's gonna say you don't have a function created, would you like to create a new project? And I can say, yes. Uh, it's asking for what language? We're using Python, obviously. Uh, okay, and here is where you need to be careful. If you have Python 3.10, it's not gonna like it. It's going to complain. Um, the latest version you can use is Python 3.9, right? So just bear that in mind uh, while you're working on this. Um, otherwise, you are going to have a fun time like I did today uh, debugging this code. So I am going to select the first one because I want Python 3.9. Um, this, this is one of the important parts. It's asking you if you want to use a template, um, right? And there are a lot of options. Um, Azure Functions has a lot of integrations, right? Uh, so there's a timer trigger. That's the one we'll be using. There's an HTTP trigger. Those of you who know what a REST API request is, you can trigger your code uh, using a REST API request as well, right? There is a blob storage trigger. This is probably the more, one of the most useful things. And I've used this a lot personally. Um, so Azure blob storage, you can think about it as sort of like Google Drive and uh, what happens is every time you upload something to that Azure Blob storage, it will trigger this piece of code, right? Very cool. Uh, you can even uh, filter out the different types of files uh, that trigger the code as well. And you can even, uh, you know, do some operations on the content of those files as they are uploaded, right? So this is probably the, my favorite one, Blob storage trigger. And then there are multiple other triggers that I haven't even used personally, right? So, yeah, this Azure function is really versatile, really cool. Uh, I don't, I'm not marketing for Azure, but uh, yeah, I think this is one of the uh, nicer things to have on a cloud platform, right? So I'm going to select timer trigger. You can name it whatever. I'm just gonna leave it the default name for now. Okay, this is important again. Um, so it wants you to put a cron expression to tell it how often it should trigger, right? Uh, what, what is a cron expression? You can go ahead and Google that. It's like, you know, it's uh, similar to how no one really remembers. Uh, I forget what that thing is. Uh, regular expressions, right? So everyone knows what regular expressions is, but no one really remembers um, how to make a certain regular expression when they need it, right? So it's something like that. Uh, you can go ahead and Google it. There are uh generators that you can use just like there are generators for uh regular expression to figure out how this works um i am going to set this to a really low uh trigger interval just so that we can see how it works i'm going to say trigger every 10 seconds please don't deploy a 10 second script uh to azure functions it's going to cause a lot of people to complain right and in fact, don't even deploy local uh, this locally. And don't let it run for too long. I'm going to only let it run for a few seconds, uh, maybe two or th uh, 
In fact, let's make this five seconds so I don't have to leave this running for long. Uh, don't run something like this uh, on the cloud or for too long on your local machine. Uh, I guarantee it, someone is going to complain if you do that, right? This is uh, where the second warning comes in. If someone is nice enough to let you web scrape their website, don't overload their servers with multiple, with a large number of requests. And when you scale this up from your local machine all the way up to Azure's cloud platform, A, that's going to give you a huge bill at the end of the month, and B, that is probably going to get you in a lot of trouble, right? So uh, please keep that in mind when you're working with this cloud platforms. Uh, a colleague of mine says, uh, uh, cloud platforms are really cool, but if you don't know how they work, they are very, very dangerous and uh, they're actually really scary, right? So, okay, I am going to go ahead and press enter and it's going to start, uh, you know, setting up all of these things. So you can see it created all of these uh, folders for me. Um, if I was not using um, the Azure Functions extension, I would have to do this uh, myself, right? Okay, so we have our function set up. Um, okay, in the interest of time, I am just going to copy the code from the Git repository and paste it here. Um, the code is essentially the same. We are doing pretty much the same thing that we were doing before. Um, we are making a client object. We are getting the HTML page. We are parsing it into a soup object, and then we are navigating to our relevant um, data that we want, which in this case is price, right? Uh, the only difference that I've added here is that whenever it triggers, it is going to save a file with the name. Uh, it's going to have the prefix PS5. It's going to have the timestamp that it was triggered in, and it's going to be a standard UTC timestamp and it's going to save that CSV file. Uh, I'm going to run this locally, uh, but you can run this in the cloud and you can save it to Azure Blob Storage. You can save it to wherever you want. Um, I don't want to leave this running for too long. Uh, that's why I'm only going to run this locally so that you know I can um, close it immediately uh, after it's run a couple of times. So yeah, there we have it. And if if you want to run a script, if you want to uh, debug a script, you press F5, it starts the debug. Okay, so it's gonna ask me to use the storage account. Okay, so it wants me to attach a storage account because there are some things that I need to, uh, that uh, functions need to store in storage to, you know, maintain uh, functionality. I hope this works. Oh, it's complaining. I know why it's complaining. Um, okay, so it's complaining that I don't have the package beautiful soup, right? And the reason it's complaining is that we haven't told it that you need that package, right? So there is this requirements or text file. Um, so every time you run this, this um, uh, it installs all the packages that are listed here. When you're deploying this to Azure Functions, you will need to tell it what functions, uh, what libraries do you want uh, it to install for the code to function. Right. So, yeah, I usually forget to edit this as well. And I end up confused as to why my Azure function isn't working. So, there are some libraries that are built in, but um, some you need to actually tell it, right? You need to install, right? So, we need VS4 and we need uh, what was the other one? Pandas, right? Yeah. So, I can do this. I can save the requirements file. I'm going back to my uh, function. F5 again, and this time it should actually, yeah. So you, you can see it's running the install command for BS4 and for pandas, right? In the terminal here. Right? And while it's running, I can look at some questions. Okay, it started running and hopefully we should start seeing an output soon. Oh, we have, we have started seeing an output. So you see this file here, and then there's a new file that was just created, and there should be a new file soon. There's another file, right? So it's running this command and keeps it keeps saving the CSV file, right? 
and it'll keep saving the CSV file as long as it's running, right? Every five seconds, it's going to get a new CSV file. And there you go, right? Your function is now automated. You can run this on your local machine. If you want to put, push this onto the Azure cloud, you can push it there with a more reasonable time interval, maybe not five seconds, right? So, yeah. And this is, yeah, this is probably the coolest uh, part of uh, today's webinar. I, I, yeah, I really like this uh, fact that you can automate pretty much anything using Azure Functions. Um, you don't have to use a timer trigger. You can use an HTTP trigger. You know, every time you call a REST, REST endpoint, it will trigger the function if you want to run it like that. And I think I should stop it before uh, eBay starts to have a problem. Yeah, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I think these are about maybe 30 files, yeah. So yeah, there you go. Uh, that is how you can automate your Azure Functions, uh, your, your web scripting script using Azure Functions, right? Uh, all of this code is available on the Git repository that our team should have posted, uh, whether you're on Zoom or one of our socials, um, that link should be available. You can copy this, you can um, clone the repository, you can play around with this code. You will have to set up the Azure Function project yourself. Um, I haven't given the entire structured project uh, there. I've only given the um, the function code. So the, the, just the thing that goes in init.py. Uh, anything else that you might need, um, you know, you're going to have to go to VS Code, set up that project, and uh, do everything uh, for that, right? But yeah, that is pretty much uh, all I had uh, for today. I hope you guys. Uh, I hope you learned something. I hope this was. Uh, as cool for you as it is uh, for me. Um, yeah, I think uh, Nathan, uh, you can you know, take uh, take over. Nathan, you're muted. You know, we live in a remote working world, but I can never remember to unmute myself. Um, so thanks, Arham, for this. And a uh, special shout out to Fatima Rafiq, who is our community organizer here. She's the one that set all this up. Um, so thank you very much, Fatima. Um, we will be online for probably another five minutes, um, just in case somebody needs the, uh, the, the code repo or, or the link to get the certificate. Um, so Arham, with, for those five minutes, I'll probably just have you answer some questions because I think there's still quite a few. Sure. Uh, to answer some that people may already have or may already know the answer to, uh, yes, this is recorded and we will also post it on our YouTube channel as well as our own a tutorial website, which is online.datasciencedojo.com. Uh, we do have more Python events coming up that are free events, free to join. Um, uh, coming up with us, they're fairly popular with presenters as well. Um, and our next event is actually going to be um, a Redis crash course for artificial intelligence and machine learning. So if you haven't heard of Redis, um, I definitely suggest uh, you get familiar with it. Join our crash course next week. It's on March 22nd. Um, and there will also be a certificate of attendance available for that crash course. Um, we, if you would like to get a deeper dive into Python, uh, we do have a paid program that you can take a look at. It's called an introduction to Python for data science. So if you really want to dive deep into Python, um, specifically for data science purposes, um, take a look at that. And um, yeah, we'll just hang out for about five more minutes and then uh, end the webinar there. So Arham, why don't you go ahead um, open up that Q&A tab, answer some more mm -hmm. questions, and then I will cut you off when uh, in about five minutes. Sure. Okay. So we have a question. What's the normal time for a timer trigger? So Mike, um, there is no normal time. It depends upon what your application is. Just, you know, be reasonable, I would say. Uh, not millions of, as long as it's not um, I, I, again, I don't have a number, right? It, it would depend upon the website you, owner, what they see as unreasonable, right? And usually they would have that detailed in their terms of service. Uh, I can't comment on what's in, I mean, I would imagine uh, once every 10 minutes should be fine. But again, I can't comment on that because it depends on the website owner. Um, and it depends upon what your application is, right? So if uh, what what level of granularity um, you your application requires, right? So if you want to go every uh, get data every day, if you want to go get data every hour, if you want to go get data every minute, right? Uh, it depends upon the granularity, right? So um, 
yeah, there, there's that's a slightly comp complicated uh, question for uh, me to answer. Uh, I hope I've tried. Uh, I have answered it the best I can. Um, okay. Uh, anything else? Let me see. Oh yes, one more thing. You will need an Azure subscription if you want to actually run this. Um, you can run this on a local machine using uh, Azure Storage Emulator, but that's um, personally I've never been able to get that to work. It's kind of finicky, uh, but theoretically you can run this without an Azure subscription uh, using a local emulation. It's called it's called the Azure Storage Emulator. It emulates um, the Azure Blob Storage on your local machine. So you can just attach your a local function to your local emulation and run it like that. Um, personally, I've never gotten to um, run uh, that way. It's a little bit finicky. There's uh, not many people do it that way because it's, uh, yeah. Uh, but if you wanted to you know, avoid the cost of um, the Azure platform, you could do it that way as well, right? Uh, it is theoretically possible, even though I haven't uh, been able to do that. Uh, Alex asks, what approach would you take for scra scraping a website? A more messy site, let's say one that the classes aren't necessarily the same. So Alex, the only way to do that is if else statement, try catch uh, blocks, right? So figure out what the uh, edge cases are, figure out where problems might happen, add those if else statements, add those try catch blocks um, to you know, uh, address those problems, right? And again, it's about finding patterns and figuring out how you can extract data from those patterns, right? Okay, uh, anything else? Can you combine pages when products extend into multiple pages? Yes, you can. That is not something that I showed today, but essentially, so the way that you see, um, so the way that I showed you that you can just replace the search term in a certain place and get a new web page for that search term. Uh, most pages tip, uh, typically they have something in their URL that tells you which page of results you should be on. So if you can find that one place, uh, you can just you know uh, keep adding new numbers there and loop over multiple pages, get multiple pages of results and combine all of those results uh, into one, right? How do you scrape the website if it needs authentication or some other interaction like clicking a button or filling a form, right? So um, for the authentication part, if, uh, so that's uh, going into whether they want you to, if they're asking for authentication, they might not be okay with you uh, scraping it, but let's say that they are okay with you, but they just want you to authenticate. Um, there are ways to actually set, uh, so, I showed you a bare bones client. Uh, we didn't really customize that client, right? But you can change the client to behave like you can tell it to advertise that, hey, I'm a Firefox browser or I'm a Safari browser, right? You can do things like that. Similarly, you can add authentication parameters to it as well. Um, as for interaction, um, personally, I haven't done I haven't uh, done that, but I have heard that you can use things like Selenium to, uh, you know, uh, it, it to, if you want to add uh, things like clicking, if you want to like drag and drop something, you can do that through Selenium. Um, I haven't done that personally, so I can't comment on uh, how you would do that, but you can look, take a look at Selenium um, if you want to do that. The limitations of using web scraping commercially versus doing it for yourself at home. Uh, what do you mean by commercially is would be my question. I would assume uh, you are doing it for some uh, monetary benefit, uh, business use. So uh, most websites, yeah, the terms of service might, they might not be okay with that, right? Um, yeah, I'm not sure how to answer this question. It would depend upon what you mean by using web scraping commercially. If you can give me an example, maybe I can uh, answer that better. Any free tools for scraping? Sajad, so, yeah, this is a free tool for scraping. Python is free. All of these libraries are free. Uh, the only thing that costs money here is uh, the Azure subscription, but you don't have to get that, right? 
All right, Arham, uh, I'm going to cut you off there. Uh, thank you again for joining. Thank you, Fatima, for setting all this up. And thank you, everyone, if you joined in today. Um, hopefully, Arham was able to give you some good tips and, and help you with web scraping. Um, and I'm looking forward and hoping that we'll see you um, at some of our upcoming events. So thank you again, and I hope you all have a good rest of your day.